So back in high school, I was almost always one of the earliest people to show up in class. So I'd always have a few minutes to talk with my friends. I fondly remember one morning sharing an idea I came up with for a game. Say you were a 2D side-scroller character, but your world was a Rubik's Cube. You're on the red face. Gravity points down, and you can walk around and have a good time. But an insurmountable wall blocks you from visiting the yellow face. It's invisible in this footage, but just pretend with me. So, gravity points down, and you can fall down to the green face. But the wall extends down to here, too. Curses. What other options do you have? Well, let's start over. You can move to the white face, but that doesn't change much. But wait, now you can drop down to the green face and suddenly gravity is sideways. You can just walk up the wall. So up you go onto the red face where gravity is sideways now. Keep going to the blue face and now you're on the yellow face on the other side of the wall and gravity is back to normal. Isn't that a neat idea? Gravity that changes direction according to some basic rules? My friend thought it was neat, but it's just an idea. But me? I like to build things. I knew a little bit about programming. I'd made some pieces of a game before. I could probably do this. So, I got to work, programming a little bit each day after school and on weekends. Each morning at school I'd show my friends the latest build of the game. I'd design and test levels before classes started. Watching this idea unfold into a playable game was a really fun experience. Anyway, enough reminiscing. Let me show you what I actually came up with. And this is it. I never actually finished it. This is the last build before I stopped. Draft 37, dated August 20th, 2009. Debug buttons litter the screen. Blat. A test level. Loads, but with errors. A giant green button beckons to a good friend of mine. This also produces errors. It's the product of almost a full year of teenage me coding and designing and dealing with high school. I doodle ideas in my planner. If I have a good memory from high school, it either involves this or music somehow. Anyway, on March 16th, 2011, Adult Swim posted a completed version of my game to the website. Cardboard Box Assembler. Whack. But interesting. I always thought it'd be fun to compare the two, but never actually dug into it. It's been 11 years since. If you look at the channel I run now, I focus on music. More importantly, I've had incredible luck reaching out to game musicians and talking to them. Maybe that luck could extend to the developers of this old Flash game. Maybe I could learn something. Respectively, it does, and I did. The two-word summary of my findings? Ideas snowball. Join me on a little adventure as I elaborate on what I mean by that. Okay, first, let's look at where my idea started, a Rubik's Cube. I was enamored with the idea that each face was its own space with its own gravity that you could change. This idea was the seed that I held onto. I put a lot of effort into making each face unique and Rubik's themed. I also put a lot of effort in making the cube rotate as smoothly as possible so that only one face was visible at a time. This led to a bit of an issue. It was hard to keep yourself oriented. Because I was so focused on the faces of my cube, my solution was to create background art that had an obvious up and down direction while keeping that Rubik's theme. This helped, but didn't stop the constant struggle of keeping orientation discernible. I began trying to solve this problem through level design, where I tried to place every wall and floor in such a way that it was obvious which way was up. Surely there's a better way. A more fundamental solution at the core that we could tackle, perhaps. Well, let's compare this with how Miguel, the designer behind Cardboard Box Assembler, approached his game. His starting idea was to just project a 2D platformer onto a 3D object. No Rubik's involved. In fact, the only reason we're on a cube is because cubes are easy. No need to think about topology or what have you. His focus was on the player, quite literally. The camera, and thus the rotation of the cube, followed the player. In practice, this meant that the cube was always at an angle, allowing the player to look ahead somewhat. This solved the orientation problem for free and is actually quite common in third-person 3D games. They solved this in Mario 64. See how the camera looks ahead, allowing you to see where you can go? Basic navigation stuff. Additionally, the cube is transparent. You can see the other side. This is an incredibly helpful tool to get your bearings. And it never occurred to me because I was so attached to my idea that the cube has to be Rubik's themed and Rubik's cubes are not transparent. Colors only. 
Interestingly, uh, Miguel described his camera behavior as an aesthetic choice. I mean, you don't want the player to forget they're in a cube after all. Just from the footage I've shown so far, you might have noticed a key difference in our cubes. My cube is tiny. When I was programming the basic engine, I wasn't thinking too much about it just yet. I just wanted to have some room for the player character, at the time a blue rectangle, to move around. Mission accomplished, a tiny enclosure for my little guy. But if you look at this and then look at Miguel's game, it's hard not to notice that the latter is huge. We talked about this a bit, and Miguel was surprised that I didn't run out of space to build levels. Well, actually I did. I needed to redo some code in my game to support the larger levels a good five months into development. But during those five months, small levels. And critically, these smaller levels influenced the ideas I had later on. Fundamental movement options. Like for example, So here's the question. A central component to the gameplay here is changing the gravity on your current face. Let's say you want to point gravity so that you can walk on this wall here. There's two paths available. This one's easy. But this one could be fun. If only you could go up. How do you go up? My solution? Anti-gravity. Jump super high. I think it was five times the player height. That's plenty enough to make the distance to the top and around the corner. And if you need some extra velocity, you can stack some anti-gravity power up or something. Maybe throw in a boost. So many options. Miguel's solution? Ladder. Duh. Simple. Okay, to give myself some credit, my solution made sense for the tiny size of my levels. You would need an absurd jump to clear the ceiling on a cardboard box level. So you could still work this into the corners, I guess, like literal edge cases. But the thing is, once you jump, you're married to it. The only way to stop the jump is to land or pause the game, I guess. When you're on a ladder, you can stop and chill whenever you want. Talking to Miguel, he pointed out that this was an incredibly valuable asset for players when they were playtesting. This kind of reflects on how I've been playing the prototypes of my own game. Pausing to look ahead, making my plan of action, and then executing it. Pause, plan, execute. Miguel was building his game such that you'd act first, explore, and jump ahead without planning too much. Both of these approaches are fine, interchangeable between games even, but ladders make so much more sense if you're playing like Miguel, and according to his playtests, most people had a playstyle close to his own action-first approach. So I think the process of making content for your games is kind of important. You need to be able to work with your tools, and how your game is built will affect the tools that you can use. My levels were all bitmap based. Black pixels were solid ground or wall. White pixels show the background image. And I'd like to emphasize that I mean this literally. Each level of my game was composed of six bitmap images. My level editor was six instances of MS Paint. This allowed for total freedom of the height of walls and floors and such, but I don't think that really helped anything. In fact, I think it made my collision detection harder to code than it needed to be, as I tried to account for tiny slivers of floor at terminal velocity. Miguel took a tile-based approach. His editor? Tile-ed. This is what he saw. Though incidentally, this is how I designed my own levels, on paper. Looking back, the tile size granularity is probably all the game ever needed. Although, I actually made a second game using the same bitmap engine, but built a level editor on top of the game. And I think this is the best approach from a creation standpoint, a level editor in-game. When I brought this up with Miguel, we seemed a bit divided in philosophies on this. Uh, to quote his thoughts, if you build tools to make games, you're building tools to build games, not games. In my experience, building tools has been, most of the time, a disguised form of procrastination. And I'm not sure this matches my experience, although it's hard to argue with the fact that this man did not build his own tools and actually shipped a game instead, right? Well, not quite. The distinction is the timeline. He's arguing against focusing on the tools before the game. He was able to use pre-existing tools, but it's perfectly fine to write your own. But you need to develop them in parallel with your game. The danger comes from building tools from the game you haven't been playing. And this perfectly aligns with my experience. My tools only allowed me to make tiny levels, so future design decisions were built around that. They didn't have to be, and I didn't realize that until far later. In fact, that's kind of the thesis here. If there's a single lesson I want to convey, it's that game development snowballs. 
The direction of your game will be deeply influenced by the direction of the seed of the idea that you started with, and you should keep that in mind. Keeping one face visible at a time seemed like the perfect solution to camera movement, but I saw the Rubik's Cube inspiration as a fundamental, immutable characteristic of my game's design, and it didn't need to be. Anti-gravity jumping seemed like a perfect solution to upwards transversal, but I took the small size of my cube as a given. It didn't need to be. Perhaps if I'd used a waterfall style of development instead of my go-to rapid prototype iteration mayhem, all this would have been covered in the planning stage, but I approach all my projects with rapid iteration, and maybe, if you do the same, this experience can serve as a cautionary tale for your own development adventures. If nothing else, it was a fascinating experience for myself, revealing patterns in my thoughts that I would have never picked up on if not for this A-B comparison. To close out, I just want to shout out everyone that I talked to real quick. Uh, shout out to Miguel, the, the main programmer and designer for a Cardboard Box Assembler. We chatted for a good while and I feel like it was really insightful. When I reached out, he had just finished a game called Death Wish, which is a short but clever little puzzle game. The dude has a really good sense for design. Shout out to Fern, uh, we didn't talk as much since I was mostly curious about design elements and they were primarily the artists, but they're still happy to answer my questions. Check them out here. Cardboard Box Assembler is a flash game, which means it's on a dead medium. Luckily, you can still play it on Flashpoint, a really nice archive of all Flash games. My game can be found in some scrap folders on my hard drive, eternally unfinished. Uh, no link for that one, sorry. And that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching.